Hello again, everyone. I'm Dick Stockton, and welcome to Stockton. In today's episode, I am talking to pro golfer and uh, a friend of mine named Stuart Sink. You all know about him. Now, I met him several years ago at a restaurant near Fort Lauderdale owned by Jerry Greenbaum, who owns uh, several outstanding restaurants. This is not a plug for him. I should plug the fact that he's one of the outstanding amateur golfers and has been for many, many years. Anyway, Stuart uh, and I got to know each other a bit. We played in in the same foursome. I was nervous, and I realized at that point that uh, when you play with a pro, uh, he doesn't judge what you do and actually doesn't care how you play. And I learned that uh, early on. He wants you to do well, but if you don't, hey, it's just a round. But the one thing that impressed me about Stuart is that he's a first-class person. He's got a great story. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Stuart Sink to the broadcast. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you, Dick. It's a pleasure to be on with you. Well, normally we would uh, start talking about golf and then go into other things, but uh, there is no way I can bury the lead here uh, because uh, you have a tremendous story, and uh, it's a a life story. It's a family story. It's about your wife, Lisa, and the fact that she uh, has had breast cancer, and all that has gone uh, with it, with the two of you and your family sharing it. So I have to ask you right off the top, how is she doing? And tell us about the story of your, your wife and her courageous battle here. Yeah, uh, well, I appreciate you asking. It's um, been a little over a year now, about 13 months since we first found out. And um, she has been in diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, which... Uh, I'm sure a lot of the listeners and your friends and family have, uh, you know, a lot of knowledge about it, unfortunately, but it's um, only about 5% of cases are at stage four when they're diagnosed. And so it's really unusual, but she's uh, responded really well to treatment and um, it's had an amazing sort of secondary impact on our lives as, uh, you know, a married couple and Christians. And it's just, uh, you know, it's been horrible and wonderful all at the same time. And, um, just it's it's living i mean now we're fighting she's fighting i'm sort of a, in a supporting role fighting too for her with her but it's uh this is it's real living now you know it's uh it's no longer you know getting upset about you know our flight delayed or uh you know i can't qualify for a certain tournament or whatever it's uh life has been sort of a stripped down to sort of a core value and and that is life itself you know and it's just a lot more a lot a lot more meaningful and a, a pure type of life than it used to be there's no question but she's doing pretty well she's doing real well right now um she's kind of stabilized and she's in sort of a remission kind of state although they don't really use that term with breast cancer as much but it's she's sort of in an area right now in a place where she's kind of been stable for quite a while and she's uh that's uh, kind of what they were hoping for for those who don't uh, follow golf as uh, you know seward sink uh, who's uh, a native of Alabama, born and raised there, was the winner of the 2009 Open Championship, and that's the British Open Championship, uh, one of the great majors. He spent over 40 weeks in the top 10 of the official world golf ranking between 2004 and 2009, still very active on the PGA circuit. He's played in some 16 tournaments so far. Uh, he has uh, done very well, finishing you know either tied or third in the other majors, the Masters, uh, the, the PGA Championship in the U.S. Open, member of five Ryder Cup teams, and a winner there. So uh, uh, many people may not remember Stuart Sink. Uh, he's still active. He's uh, just turned the age of 44. But I want to talk more about uh, your wife. Now, you took some time off. I mean, you even supported her to the extent that you shaved your head. And uh, when you first – tell me what it was like <laughs> when you first heard about the diagnosis, Stuart. Well, first of all, let's, I need to correct you on one thing because my head is shaved, not because of Lisa. <laughs> it's just shaved because I'm bald. So, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, one of the things I promised Lisa when we uh, first found out about this, trying to be, you know, joking and light as I could possibly be, I, I offered to shave my head four times a week instead of three, and she didn't think that would be that big of an impact. So, you know, I, I <laughs> kind of abandoned that line of uh, support. But now I've, I've had, uh, it was actually a pretty funny story. Um, we're going on 10 years now. Uh, I was in a tournament in Charlotte, the Wells Fargo. You know, um, recently the Wells Fargo was played at Wilmington, but normally it's at Quail Hollow in Charlotte. And so uh, in 08 it was, so it's nine years ago, 
I was playing there, and I, I played with, uh, I believe I played with Mickelson last day, and so we were in pretty good shape in the tournament up near the top, and when you play with Mickelson, you just get more TV time because, you know, there's 100 cameras around his group. And so uh, I was uh, finishing up on the last hole and might have made a birdie putt or something there on the last hole and got some TV time, and when I took my hat off to uh, shake Mickelson's hand, you know, well, they were showing us, you know, Sink and Mickelson finishing up here, and so anyway, I didn't think much about it. Well, um, I drive home from Charlotte, four-hour drive back to my house in Atlanta. I get there, and Lisa, nine years ago now, Lisa has recorded the round on DVR, and she has the finishing hole pause. And I walk in, and the first thing she says, no, not, uh, oh, I'm so glad you're home, and oh, I miss you this week. It's, I want you to see this. And I thought she was going to show me some shot, you know, like, look how good this putt is, or look at this bounce you got, or whatever. No, she goes straight to the handshake when my head come, my hat comes off and my tan line is atrocious. My hair on the top and sides is thin and it's black. And my tan is, you know, I got a white, thin areas on my scalp and my neck is almost like dark brown. And she says, and I quote, look how bad that is. Look how bad that looks. You got to shave it. So I was already thinning. So we went straight to the back, lathered up, shaved it on down. So that was 2008. And that's how the story of my baldness began. <laughs> and you're going to stick to it, and I and I understand. <laughs> Tell me about uh, how much she has been an inspiration to you. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways. I mean, there's so many different different ways that I remember going back to, like that first day when she got the phone call, and I was uh, we were at home, and it was you know. It was a totally a God thing when that I was home at all because I was totally expecting and preparing to play that week in New Orleans, and uh, just by kind of a strange twist of fate, I forgot to commit. You have to uh, on the PGA Tour that you have a deadline of 5 p.m. the Friday prior to officially commit yourself into the tournament through the PGA Tour headquarters, and you can do it now on your cell phone or on the computer or by calling or whatever. But you have to let them know, count me in, and uh, every week same thing. And so um, I was laying about to go to bed at about the Friday night before, and I was planning on playing New Orleans, and all of a sudden the thought went through my head, like, I don't remember committing to the tour that I'm going to play next week. And so um, I kind of checked all my little records that you have with the tour online, and sure enough, I had forgotten to commit to the tournament, so I'm out. And I'm all bummed out. You know, dang, what am I thinking? You know, And it's the first time in 20 years on the tour that I had done that. And so uh, I had to call my caddy, and my, my dad called about 7 a.m. next morning, how come you're not in the field in New Orleans? You know, and I had to explain it to him. It was, I felt like it was the worst thing that could happen. Well, it just turned out that it was meant to be, because uh, three days later, actually five days later on Wednesday, uh, Lisa got the call about her, the results for her biopsy. And um, so fortunately, I was able to be at home when that call came and not in New Orleans and her be home alone. And I got to uh, be there. Uh, just to, you know, provide whatever help I could to, you know, to her. So it was really great that she didn't have to be alone to get that phone call. And um, I just remember when the call came, uh, you know, she went outside to sit on the porch by herself uh, to receive the call. And I walked out and immediately I saw her with a pen and paper writing a bunch of things down and notes of information. I didn't know what they were and it just uh, didn't look good. And she kind of put the phone down for a moment and looked up at me and she kind of shook her head. And, uh, you know, that moment is, uh, it's hard to even go back and talk about that because I remember the way I felt and the feeling comes back fast. So, um, but that was, uh, started quite a, quite a long process. It's going to be going for a long time. She accompanies you to most, if not all the tournaments you play. Yeah. Yeah. She's been out with me, um, almost everywhere since last year when I started playing again, that was the plan for our lives. You know, before this, we had kids really young. So, um, I'm 44 and my, um, my kids are 23 and 20. One's just graduated from Clemson a couple weeks ago, and uh, one is a uh, sophomore at Georgia Tech. So we're empty nest. And our plan all along was, you know, we had kids year early and didn't really have that newlywed time without kids. We just had kids right away, bang, bang. And our empty nest time was going to come early. We knew that. So we always planned on that to sort of be our newlywed time, you know, travel and see the world. And, you know, that was the plan, you know, travel to tournaments. And uh, as long as the PGA Tour will have me as a player. I'll keep playing, and I'm enjoying it. And so um, when we found out about Lisa's diagnosis, well, of course, the first priority was let's get, you know, what we need done on treatments and get the plan going for that, and that was that became the top priority for sure. But then uh, once the treatment plan became set and once uh, we saw that she reacted fairly well to it, uh, and I mean from a side effect perspective, then we realized that we could sort of work a travel schedule framework into that 
So our calendar looked like uh, a little different than most people's calendars because we only traveled on the weeks where we knew she would be feeling pretty well and um, finished with the side effects from that previous treatment. So basically, we, we called it third weeks. She had treatment every three weeks, and her third week, she was usually pretty well feeling back to normal. And so we, we knew that any tournaments that occurred on third weeks, that um, if, as long as it was a tournament I was in, any tournaments that occurred on third weeks, I could go. And she could go with me, and we knew that it was fairly predictable she would feel well, and I could go and I could play some tournaments. And, you know, we would kind of resume that normal sense of life that we were uh, planning to be doing anyway. And so um, for about the rest of the last year, for most of 16, from starting May 1st through the rest of 16, we were that was our calendar, third weeks. And then uh, we would go straight from the third week tournament back to uh, either Houston at MD Anderson or um, – Atlanta, where her uh, interim treatments are, and she would have her treatment. And uh, then we would spend the first two weeks sort of getting through that, and then another third week would come. And so that's, that's how the schedule worked out last year. And, and I got, you know, I did about, I don't know, seven tournaments last year after the diagnosis, but um, it was just a huge blessing that we were able to do that. I mean, we went to places like Switzerland. I played in the European Tour event in the mountains in Switzerland, and, I mean, that's amazing over there. What an experience. And we we didn't know in May last year that when we got our diagnosis that we would be seeing much of Switzerland in September of last year. And so that was just a huge treat. How does the British Open uh, fit into the third week plan this year? Uh, last year it didn't, and so I didn't play. Uh, this year, well, we're kind of past the third week stuff now because she's out of her chemotherapy. She ended that back in November. And so now she's on more of a maintenance treatment schedule, which is still heavy-duty medications, and she still has to you know, have her infusions every three weeks through her port and all that stuff. But the chemo is out. So the chemo is what's most toxic. So now we're, we're back to uh, a little bit more than just third weeks, which is um, it's nice. Her side effects have been less, and, uh, but she's still responded well. So um, she's had a good, a good go of it, you could say, as far as her treatment and her response. Lower side effects than some might expect and, uh, and a good response. You know, what the cancer cells are showing is a good response. And so this year, I haven't even looked as far ahead yet as the British Open. Um, that's another thing that changed for me is normally I would plan my schedule out about 12 weeks in advance and kind of know where I'm going to be and all that, you know, thinking in a selfish way, uh, what do I have to worry about except for golf tournaments? <laughs> well, that's changed a little bit. So um, now I don't really think much past her big checkups. So whenever she has a big check up where they go and give her the whole work up once again to find out what everything's doing. I don't really plan on anything after those because, you know, there's just so much uncertainty. I don't want to plan anything and have to go back and change or, you know, I just, we don't really plan past those dates. And she just had one a couple, two weeks ago and she got a, another nice report, good report. Everything looked nice on the, on her checkup this time. So, so now I'm planning out basically through the rest of the summer and we just haven't really gotten into uh, planning at the British yet. At this point, I'm, I'm expecting to be there. That's great news, Stuart. Uh, you know, in today's world, discussion about faith uh, sometimes is pushed to the background or even worse. Um, where would you be without faith in this whole issue? I don't even want to think about that, Dick. I mean, to be honest, it, it would be um, it, it's scary to me to think about how somebody would go through something like Lisa's going through without it. You know, I, I thought that I had a pretty good walk with Christ going for, um, you know, in my life until then, until last year. And uh, I didn't realize how much I would lean on my faith as, uh, as this year's worn on um, for peace, for confidence, for treading water, countless ways. I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, it's hard to uh, be so close to someone that's having such a struggle and you're not. I mean, I'm not having the struggle physically. It's just uh, I would trade places with her in a heartbeat, you know. There's just so many things emotionally that you're just not prepared for. We're not really prepared to deal with this kind of stuff. None of us. So um, the faith has been a huge piece of this for us, and, and it's. Um, I think Lisa's really having an impact on a lot of people through it. You know, um, there a lot of people are watching. A lot of people are, are wondering how someone who is a professed Christian handles something like this. I mean, this is bad news, right? The kind of the worst kind of news you could receive, really. Um, and so. Um, I think it's important for people to know how, how much gratitude Lisa has. And she's got this amazing heart of gratitude. And um, because we're Christians, we're not impervious to suffering. It means we're not, like, exempt from suffering. It's just that we have something else to sort of ride us through the suffering 
that is more important than our circumstances. And so um, even as tough as the circumstances are, there's still circumstances. We're going to move through them, and then in a couple of weeks they'll be different and, you know, maybe better, maybe worse. And uh, it just gives us a sort of sense of, like, uh, you know, buoyancy. Like uh, one of my favorite sermons is uh, there's a guy named Tim Keller that some, some of the listeners and you may have heard of, but he's a really good pastor uh, as far as delivering sermon that can really have an impact on your life, like today. And um, he talks about the Apostle Paul wrote so much in the New Testament, and he talks about having this buoyancy. And it's like he says, we're down, but we're not out. So, you know, we get knocked down, but we can get back up. And how do you do that? It's through this joy. It's through this focus on something else that we know is there and something more important than what we're in, whether it's three putts or winning a major or a cancer diagnosis. It just gives a sort of sense of buoyancy to your life. Stuart, did you ever feel tested? Yeah, I mean, for sure. It, it, it feels that way, but I don't, I don't feel it like it's a, a sense of really honestly being tested. Like, I don't feel like God's putting me to the test, you know, in that, in that sense, exactly. I just feel like it's, it's a, it would be a test for anybody because it's testing, but I don't think it's a test. I just think that it's, um, it's kind of like God's going fishing in a way, you know. He, he loves us all the same, all of us, and he, that'll never change. But he wants us so bad. He wants us to come back to him. And a lot of times what we feel like is bad circumstance is really him trying to capture us back in. Because, um, you know, a lot of times stuff like this happens to people and, and you have a choice. It's kind of a fork in the road. You either you choose to turn away from God or you choose to turn toward God. And um, I think in that for that reason, a lot of people, are, that's why a lot of people want to see, you know, how does, how does Lisa sink? How does Stuart sink? How do their family handle something like this? And so... Um, I think Lisa can teach people a lot of things. She has already. How do you feel about the game of golf now? Um, obviously, you know that um, you know a, a three putt is not going to be as important as, as significant to you as it was before. But uh, golf is a very difficult game. Uh, I don't care if you're the number one pro, you know, uh, leading the, the FedEx Cup standings, or if you're just any kind of amateur. Uh, how do you look at the game now with your perspective of it? You know, I sure wish I could just say, oh, my gosh, you know, this uh, season of our life, this last year has just taken all the sting out of all the bogeys. But, man, it hasn't. <laughs> it still hasn't because <laughs> it, it has, you know, I'm joking a little bit there. It, it, of course, has changed my perspective, and it's helped me to uh, focus less on myself because, really, you know, when – when you're in the pros, I mean, I like what you said a little while ago when we first started here and you're opening about um, how when we played golf together that day, you were nervous and you realized quickly that I didn't care how you played and if, if you played poorly, I didn't, it didn't bother me. Well, um, there's a lot in that statement and I'll explain that. One of the biggest struggles of a professional golfer or a professional broadcaster or anybody that does something where, you know, you're in the public eye is how attached you can be to your performance you know, your sense of yourself and your performance, right? Your self-esteem or your self-worth, it gets wrapped up in your performance. And golf, of course, you know, we're in, under the crucible out there with television cameras and the, what's on the line. It's really important to us, the crowd. Your sense of self gets wrapped up into your performance. And so that's one of my biggest battles. It's one of all of our biggest battles. So I've been fighting that. I've really spent a lot of time, money <laughs> on trying to, trying to learn how to be, you know, freed of that. And so one of the ways that I definitely learned to get better about that is, is by freeing other people of that. So, for instance, people like Dick Stockton, when I play golf with him, I wanted to go out there and have a good time playing golf with you. Do I want you to play well? Yeah, I do want you to play well because I want you to enjoy it, but not because I'm going to judge you based on how you play golf. So I, I figured that the best way to start not judging myself on the way I played and, you know, the way I performed was to stop judging people like Dick Stockton on how they performed. And so um, it's like step one. But I, I do, truthfully, I do care how you play or how anybody I play with plays because I care about them. And, and I know that everybody probably is fighting it. You said you were nervous. You were nervous because you didn't want to look like a fool in front of the pro or in front of Green Bomb or anybody, right? So um, I care how you play, but not for the reason that you might think because I, I know that you're probably suffering from the same thing even though you might not know it. And so... Uh, but that's, that's a big battle out there, and I wish that I could say, going back to you know the perspective on golf, I wish I could say that the sting of the bogeys and three putts and the balls in the water was all gone, but I still care. I'm never going to stop caring about, about the game, 
But going through what we've gone through, at least this last year, has definitely helped to sort of lessen the impacts of um, where I used to feel like every shot, every result, every made or miss cut was like do or die. And now it just doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel that way at all. It feels like uh, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed to be able to go out there and compete and, you know, maybe make relationships with people I wouldn't have otherwise, uh, whether it's in the fans or media or other players or caddies. And so um, it just feels like I'm just give, being given this gift now to go out there and compete. And in a way, you know, I, I've treated it a little bit differently in my preparation, and it's turned into a little bit better play. I haven't played that well over the last five years, but – so this year has been a little bit better, and so um, it's been more fun for that too. You know, it sounds, uh, Stuart. I may be off the mark that it, you're, it's more exhilarating for you to play now because the the pressures that you might have felt before. You're saying, "I'm going to go out and play. I'm lucky. I'm I'm a tour pro, and I have other issues here, and I'm enjoying it at my age. I'm, I'm you know, I don't know if I'll ever win the Masters or any of those things, but uh, you look forward to playing, and you're exhilarated, and I, and I think that helps you play better, perhaps. Definitely, and and my focus is still, you know, I'm still focused on playing well, but it's in a different sort of way, and it's focused in a little different direction. When I tell you that I had fear going to the golf course because of, uh, you know, maybe I wasn't putting that well or I was afraid I was going to hit a poor tee ball on, like, number 13 or something, you know, if there's a hole that was bothering me that was in my head, I had fear before I even went to the course. And so I was motivated to play well out of, obviously, wanting to play well, but also out of the fear of and trying to beat down those fears. And so that has changed. Now my focus is definitely – on the blessing and the gift that I've been given to be able to go compete. And, yeah, I mean, I'm 44 years old. You know, not many players go for this long. I mean, I've been playing uninterrupted on the tour for uh, – this is my 21st season. And um, I still feel great. I've got the distance I've had forever. And, um, you know, I'm enjoying playing with the young boys out there. But it's uh, – yeah, it is – it's exhilarating because I think I feel like I'm a little bit freed up to go and just be myself and compete and – yeah, I'm going to miss some cuts, and I'm going to play some decent tournaments and might even get, you know, up there with a chance to win a few times. And But either way, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying the ride on the roller coaster more than I used to. I used to fear those dips and those bad performances, and um, now I think back to that, like, what for? Why are you afraid of that? You know, just go out there and be yourself. There's only one way to really accomplish what you want to, and that's to not be afraid of not accomplishing it, right? You can't be afraid. That's a, a great story, and uh, and few people would even admit it, although years ago when I used to broadcast the Boston Red Sox games, and, and they were in a big pennant race, and I would go up to a pitcher and I said, what what you have? He says, I was scared to death out there. I was I was scared. Yeah. And, you know, most people don't, don't think athletes can be that way, but, but, you know, that's a great motivator for many of them. Yeah, it is, and, and the key, I think, is to admit it and not, you know, hide away from it, act like it's not there. The guys always ask me, you know, when I do outings or whatever clinics, they say, how do you guys, how do you guys perform, you know, in the clutch when, you know, without being nervous? I'm like, huh, are you crazy? I'm like almost <laughs> peeing in my pants. I'm so nervous. But you have to learn to deal through that. There's like inside of all of us in golf anyway, there's, there's two golfers. There's a golfer and there's a nervous golfer. You've got to learn both. And that's why practicing just doesn't cut it, you know. Just hitting eight iron after eight iron and driver after driver you got to learn that nervous golfer, too, and, and that's why you see guys that get in the hunt and perform well. They continue to do it for a long time because they learn how they behave. They learn, you know, I, I remember so many times when I would get into contention in tournaments, you know, I hit more of a draw, and I hit my irons a little further. That's very common, but I hit a, more, I hit a little more of a draw. I curve the ball more left. Well, I have to play for that when I get nervous, and then my body sort of tells me, it sends me a message. Pitchers, I'm sure, are the same way. You know, we're scared to death. But you got to embrace the fear and channel it instead of trying to act like it's not there. That doesn't work. You mentioned the young boys. Your some of your quick thoughts on today's young leaders that we see week in and week out, and there are several of them. Oh yeah, I, I just think that golf is in in great shape going forward. I mean, we've got we may not have Tiger Woods right now, which is unfortunate, and everybody loves watching Tiger for so many different reasons. But the guys at the top of the game right now. I mean, Dustin Johnson looks like. I would, I would say he looks like a giant killer, but he looks more like a giant <laughs> to me. Um, he just uh, <laughs> yeah. looks like he's so entrenched for a long time. And then you've got the, the 
the other guys right now who are just uh, it feels like a merry-go-round at the top with uh, Jason Day and Jordan Spieth and Rory McIlroy and Justin Rose and you know those guys. It just seems like everybody's really doing great things right now. The, the game has been transformed by distance, by you know physical fitness and biomechanics and technology with equipment. And um, I mean, the sky's the limit. I think we're going to see more scores in the 50s. We've already seen a couple this year. Uh, the technology available, if you use it right, you learn how to use it and really get the most out of it, you're going to see a lot more of this uh, young players coming out. And, and they're fearless. You know, they play a lot of tournaments against the best players when they're in teenage years and then in college. And they come to the pros ready to go. They just uh, There's no adjustment period like there used to be. You know, you talk about fear, no fear. Uh, golfers, I thought when I would watch golf, may have had a, a fear of Tiger Woods when he lurked, when he had on his uh, red shirt on the final day and was in contention. I don't know if that was a fact. Um, I don't know whether he intimidated people. He's obviously hurt now, and uh, that that story is gone. But uh, what about Tiger Woods? I know you're asked so many times, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you ab- about him. Yeah, um, I wish I knew more. I mean, un- unfortunately, he's uh, Tiger's kind of you know behind this circle of... Uh, I don't know how to describe it, but I'm whatever he's behind. I'm on the other side of it. I'm outside, so I, I know about um, what what I see on the ticker on the on the sports channel or on the news or I read in the golf magazine. That's it. So um, it sounds bad to me. To me, it sounds like multiple surgeries on your back and your knee. And um, my goodness, you know, I just don't know how you can keep coming back from that. And to be the kind of player that Tiger was, and I'm sure he wants to be. I, I just don't. I don't know if Tiger's going to be satisfied coming out there and, you know, making the cut and languishing around, you know, trying to keep his card. I don't think that's going to motivate Tiger Woods. So um, I just don't know if we're going to see him play anymore. Uh, it's sad, but I just, uh, it's hard to believe that we would see the Tiger Woods we used to know. You saw his swing in his prime. Uh, did anything that you saw there make you possibly say, you know, I could see where you could have injuries at some point? I never did. No, I, ne- I never saw that really. I'm, I just know that golf is kind of an unnatural move for the body to make, period, no matter what kind of golf swing you make. And I saw your golf swing, too, and goodness. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> giving you a hard time, of Thank course. You. Um, no, but yeah. <laughs> I, I never really saw Tiger's swing as anything other than, like, just awesome and just, like, the power. It looked as natural as any golf swing I've ever seen. It didn't look like he was doing anything weird, but the I guess the um, – the speed and the torque and the twisting and the force on his knee when he straightened his left leg and all that, you know, yeah, looking back, you can say, oh, I see. But at the time, I was just watching where the ball went in, like, amazement. <laughs> so I didn't pick up on any of that. I just saw a guy beating me a lot. I'm going to ask you two more golf situations. One, I want you to – I know the British Open um, was, was your crowning achievement, and we'll get to that after I ask you about Arnold Palmer. Yeah, of course, you know, I don't think many people um, that follow any kind of sports aren't aware that we lost Arnold in the last year or so. And so, yeah, it, it was definitely the passing of, I would say, the legend in golf because he was he was the guy that really brought golf to television and um, paved the way for greats like Jack Nicklaus and then Greg Norman and then Tiger Woods to really entrance golfers all around the world in their in their living rooms because of television. And uh, without Arnold, none of that would have happened. There's a pretty good chance that without Arnold Palmer, I wouldn't be on the Stockton podcast right now talking to you because no one would know who I am. <laughs> and you wouldn't want me to be on there. So um, we have so much of uh, a debt to Arnold Palmer and what he was able to do through his play and his charisma, his personality. Just amazing guy um, to be around. And I, I wasn't, you'd think I was around him a lot. I didn't really know him that well. I saw him at the Bay Hill tournament every year, you know, and he would come up and say hello. But we didn't really know each other that well. I got to play a practice round with him my rookie year in 1997 at Bay Hill. And all I remember from that day was on the first hole, which was the 10th hole. We started on 10. And it was a dogleg right, kind of a short par four. And I looked at the yardage book, having never played there before, and it just looked like, uh, well, it looks like a three wood would probably leave us between these bunkers, you know, and it looked like a three wood. So I had my three wood out. Arnold walks up on the tee, and this is the first time I ever met him. And he said, hi, took his hat off. My name's Arnold Palmer. Nice to meet you. And I told him my name. And he said, this is a driver hole, son. <laughs> that was 
Arnold Palmer's first <laughs> statement to me was, this is a driver hole, son. And so um, I looked kind of uh, down at the three-wood on the ground and back to my golf bag and went over to my bag and got the driver out. And uh, that was Arnold Palmer's style, I guess. He was uh, – I don't think he looked at a lot of yards books. <laughs> I think he hit drivers a lot. And <laughs> it was kind of funny that, you know, that's the way golf is now. Really, um, you see a lot more drivers. And, you know, they talk about driving distance being up. And it is, but that's because they measure all the drives now, and players are choosing to hit the ball farther off the tee than they used to. It's a less strategic game, and it's more of a hit it as far as you can and knock the cover off it and then go down there and use your wedge. That's the way Arnold Palmer played golf, if you think back to it. And so, um, in a way, Arnold's influence in the game even now more than we even think. I mean, everybody knows about his charisma and about the, um, you know how he shook every hand and signed every autograph and He's got quite a reputation, but the way we're playing golf now at the top, the guys that are playing the best and the, the modern way to play, taking advantage of equipment, taking advantage of length, and, and just uh, it's Arnold Palmer's style. And it all goes back to the first time I ever met him when he said, son, this is a driver. <laughs> his, his style of golf unquestionably has come full circle, and there's no question about that. Before I ask you about the British Open, because you talked about playing, you play with amateurs, uh, good ones and, and not so good ones. What is the most prominent thing that amateurs don't know? What they don't know. Uh, yes. Gosh, that's a long question. We need to have another podcast for that. Just that one question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer it short, though. The main problem I see when I play with amateurs, and I'm talking about anybody over about a five handicap, is, and now, I'm not even going to go down the the road of, you know, hitting the ball straighter or farther. Everybody makes those mistakes. So we're not even going to go there. But it, in putting, most everybody vastly underreads their putts. I mean, embarrassingly underreads their putts. Can't tell you how many times in the pro-am I've been on a green. And, you know, we play on pretty fast greens. So we've got to be about 30 feet from the hole. And the slope is just like the ball's going to, it's going to just break so much to the right. And this guy... I say, you got the line here? And he goes, yeah, what do you think about a cup out? And I'm like, let's go 10 feet. <laughs> 10 feet of break. And he's like, really? No way. And well, we're used to seeing it. But the, the key is when you just pay attention a little bit, you start to learn how to read greens well. That's the main mistake I see among the amateurs, the rank amateurs, is just the lack of paying attention and, therefore, a vast, vast under-reading of the break on the putts. And it, and it costs them, you know. I mean, they three-putt anywhere outside 15, 20 feet. They're just three-putting all the time. And so um, a lot of that comes from under-reading the break and underestimating how much the ball's going to turn. It's interesting you say that because mostly a lot of people and pros at our club say, hey, the, the speed, make sure the speed is right. Don't worry about the break as much. Make sure the speed is right. Well, that's true, and it's, of course, a big part of putting, but I still see the break as a bigger problem than the speed. Wow. Because uh, if you start off playing improper amount of break, then the speed is really not going to help you out very much. It goes together. certainly goes together, speed and break. But if you have a 30-footer, like the one I was just describing, that's going to break 10 feet, and you play it a cup out, then there's no speed in the world that's really going to help you out very much. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's good. interesting. I thought it was going to be something other than putting. Well, that's, that's why we need to have a separate podcast just for that question, because let's talk about bunker shots. Let's talk about... Uh, chipping out of the fairway and out of the rough, the right proper you know way to play a hole like laying up, maybe not hitting a driver on every hole, um, even though Arnold Palmer says number ten is a driver hole. <laughs> maybe um, you know we we need to do a whole a whole separate uh, podcast on just that one question. So um, we'll just schedule. We will. We'll, we'll schedule it once we end this one. <laughs> we will, Stewart. Okay, I've got to I've got to uh, finish with your the, the crowning jewel for you, the British. Open. I mean, a lot of people go through their lives without winning um, a major, and you won uh, really a, a great one. And uh, just just reminisce a bit for us on this. Sure. Yeah, it was such a fantastic week, and also happened to win a major. You know, it was just uh, a lot of reasons it was a great week. Besides that, I was in Ireland the week before with my wife and my two kids. Uh, the kids had gotten to be old enough where they were they were into golf. Neither of my boys really got that much into golf but they both played a little bit but they uh started to show some interest in some of the Lynx courses because they i love the Lynx courses and i always talk about them and they knew that so they wanted to experience it so we planned a trip over to ireland the week before the british to sort of just have a little Lynx golf vacation and i wanted to show the kids a little bit about what i was talking about and um it also served the purpose of you know getting over there and sort of a preparation for the british which was great so it, the trip started out 
on a real high note. We went to the airport. Both the kids' passports would have expired. So <laughs> couldn't get on the flight. So we had to uh, of course. call out. We had to make a connection. Uh, we, I, I used a connection in D.C. in the State Department. We flew to Washington, spent the night there, and got the passports expedited through the system, and we left the next day from D.C. So that's how our trip to, went to get over to the British the year I won started. Both the kids' passports were expired. So uh, we started day late. We got to Ireland, and um, we had a, a blast. You know, we played golf until, you know, over there you can stay out on the golf course till like 10 or 11 at night. So we stayed late and played a lot of golf holes, and we had a good old time. And, in fact, we liked it so much that we postponed our trip over to Turnberry by a day. So I didn't even get to Turnberry till about 3 o'clock on Tuesday, which is way later than most everybody gets to the majors. But I was having a good time playing with the boys, and so we um, we stayed there and got over to Turnberry at three o'clock. And I was at uh, I played a little bit on Tuesday, played Wednesday afternoon with some of my buddies, and um, didn't play that great. You know, I don't think I busted seventy five once in Ireland. It was really windy, and the game was uh, not showing a lot of signs of life. And I remember um, I was hitting balls after the round on Wednesday. I went over by myself just to hit a few balls and kind of finishing touches on the preparation and getting ready for the next day and I was uh, coming back over from the range this was about six or seven at night and um, I ran into Mike Tarico who's a good friend and you know in your business and um, I, I've been friends with him for a long time and we stopped and just exchanged our quick chat about the families and how everybody's doing and when, we were, when I was turning away to, to say goodbye he said oh by the way you got anything this week meaning with my game and I said <laughs> oh boy Mike I don't know I just don't feel like I have very much this week and so um I was being honest. I didn't. So um, we parted ways, and uh, when I got back to the hotel that night, I, I, I was thinking back to, uh, I don't remember when, maybe a year or two before, there was a tournament that I would played where I had a, a swing key, a certain key that kind of helped me with my tempo. And I just thought, you know what? When I get to the golf course in the morning for my warm-up, I'm going to use that key, and I'm gonna, that's the tempo I'm going to go for this week. It's windy. Tempo is important in the wind. Hitting it solid is important. That's what I'm going with. So having nothing else, that's what I did. I went out and shot, I don't know, 66, I think, the first day, near the lead. And it really got windy the second day, and I just hung in there and played solid. And Tom Watson was the story. Next thing I know, uh, with five or six holes to play, I'm kind of concentrating on what Watson's doing because I'm like a sports fan like everyone else. And all of a sudden I realized that, hey, I got a chance to win this thing too. And sort of uh, got into my own little focused world and finished it off, birdied the last hole, and waited for three groups. And then Watson came through and made the bogey, and we ended up in a playoff. And the rest is a little bit better known, but so a week where I finished up by winning in the fashion of uh, playoff over Tom Watson started by uh, having to delay our trip by a day so that we could go get the kids' passports expedited. <laughs> Isn't that just see that? That's a perfect example. You know, you in the situation, you think, "Oh my gosh, how could this get any worse?" The kids' passports. And look at the end. You know, it's the it's the story behind the story, and it's um, and some and that's how life works. I mean, that's it's, it's how I'm telling it's, you, it's how that life is how works. life works. If we could see it all, yeah. then it wouldn't be very interesting, would it? But we can't see it all. All we can see is what's happening right now, and we sometimes think it's great, and sometimes we think it's terrible, and we just need to have a little patience and wait and see how things work out. Stuart, I have to thank you so much for taking your time to join me on my show. It's been great speaking with you. What an education and illumination. We're going to continue to pray for Lisa and your family. Thank you for coming on. Yes, sir. and th- Thank you for the kind words, and uh, it's my pleasure to be on with you. And I will uh, I'll look forward to going back and researching some of the other stock podcasts, too. As always, I wrap up today's podcast with Taking Stock, where I offer my opinion on something that's worth a closer look. And this time, I would like to reflect on our guest for today, Stuart Sink. I love the human side of those we have seen perform in the world of sports, and too often we discuss them in terms of their achievements or failures on the playing field. But as we certainly know, we often do not examine the personal story. What I was taken with in our talk today is the following in no particular order. The effect on Stuart Sink on his total dedication and support of his wife Lisa in her fight with breast cancer. The fact that he didn't just say, Lisa, I have a tournament to play. I'll check with you and see you in a few days. No, he wanted to be with her every step of the way in every tournament he played. The fact that it made him realize that golf, even for a professional, is still a game 
It took a lot of the usual pressures off of him, and the fact that there were still times during a round when the pressure of not three-putting or making a key shot still rose within him. The admission that fear has been a great motivator for him, something I've been told by other athletes in the past. His willingness to share how much his faith played perhaps the most significant role in his and his wife dealing with their health issues, and how much his trust in the Lord got both of them through so much. And then on the lighter side, a golf story he told me after our talk, that you didn't hear him say this, that when he won the British Open, he didn't feel right as far as his game was concerned. And for all of you golfers out there, Stuart Sink had a problem with his tempo. Sound familiar? (laughs) He told me he just slowed down his backswing and allowed himself to make the full turn so that his left shoulder went under his chin. Sound familiar? That's what all of our instructors say, isn't it? Well, Stuart Sink is just like all of us. Some issues arise. It's just that, well, he's a little bit better. Well, I want to let you know that uh, next week we will be wrapping up Season 1 of Stockton. And in that episode, I'm going to be answering some of your questions. And so if you have a question or comment, please email me at info at StocktonPodcast.com and I will answer it during next week's show. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes. You won't want to miss Season 2 either. Now I want to thank my producer Peter Lyon and my all-round audio guru Scott Person. Stockton is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcasts for curious people. I'm Dick Stockton. So long, everyone.